right? How's your small group, all right? Oh, wow, that was exciting. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, thanks. So tomorrow you're going to have Thanksgiving meal. What's the thing you're looking forward to about the meal? Mashed potatoes. Gravy. Anybody looking for the gravy? And nobody cares about the gravy. Gravy. You're in the gravy. Nice. Gravy. Gravy. How about uh, cranberry sauce? Come on. I'm into cranberry sauce. I saw a can of it right over here. I almost busted it open and just started scooping it out. I, I really like some cranberry sauce. Well, so pie, anyone into the pie? What kind of pie? Pumpkin pie? Key lime pie? Apple pie? Oreo pie? That's pretty cool. I'll take some Oreo pie, that'd be all right. Uh, here's what I wanna do, I wanna pray and then we're gonna get into the word tonight. I think, I think God just might wanna say something to us tonight. He's in the business, you know God wants to connect with you, he wants to speak to you, he wants to change your life, he wants to change my life. And uh, it doesn't happen on accident. I don't think that a message would get prepared that wasn't on purpose. The Bible says that the word of God will accomplish what it was sent to do. And so as we speak the word, as we read the word, as we teach the word, I believe that God wants to do something in that process. It's not just another message or another night or another this or another that. But every moment that we, speak, that we read scripture, we speak scripture, we teach scripture, God's wanting to teach us and show us something. So I want to open my heart and say, God, teach me, show me something tonight that I would be different because of it. Will you pray with me? Let's pray. Father, thanks for your presence. God, I thank you that you're here in our midst. And what could be better than hanging out with the God of the universe? God, we are honored to host your presence here. God, thanks for being here in our midst. God, thanks for these students. Thanks for these leaders. God, what you want to say, we say do it, Lord. Say what you want to say. Do what you want to do. We're going to yield now to your spirit and to your perfect will for our lives. We say, God, your kingdom come in this place tonight as it is in heaven, in Jesus' name. Somebody say amen. amen. You know, Jesus taught us to pray, and he said, pray this way. He said, pray that my kingdom would come on the earth as it is in heaven. You know, that we should believe God for his best as it is in heaven, right here in our midst every day. And you know what we get to do as believers? We get to go release heaven into the earth. If you're a believer, if you're a follower of Christ, you got to savor the world, live on the inside of you, and guess what you get to do? You get to release heaven into the earth. You've got perfection, the perfect God's best on the inside of you, and you get to just live it out in front of people and release that to the world. That's an awesome privilege that we have. Tonight we're going to get into a new series, a, a group of messages. We call them a series of messages, and, and it, it's this. It's called Say What? I think we should have a graphic for that. It's something like, say what? Can you say that? Say what? Say what? Say what? There you go. So here's the question. Did God really say that? There are things, look at this guy. Say what? There's things that the culture, that the world out there says that God says, that are just maybe not even true. Have you ever heard, you ever heard somebody say something like, oh, that must be God. And you're like, why would God do that? Or you have questions like, you know, why do bad things happen to good people? Maybe you, your grandmother or your grandfather, maybe that, that aunt of yours or that friend of yours who is just so good and they were so godly, died of cancer. And you're like, why would God do that to my aunt or to my grandma or to my so-and-so? Or maybe some just terrible thing has happened in your family like maybe mom and dad have been divorced and you got new dad and then dad, that dad blew out and you know, now you're, you got single mom of like three or four or five kids and it's like, why God, why? And there's these questions that are out there that are like maybe really even tough to answer, tough to understand. But tonight I wanna look at, I wanna look at one thing that's out there that, that people say and have said for years to the point where there used to be a bracelet about this, the WWJD. How many of y'all have ever seen a WWJD bracelet before? And it stands for, what would Jesus do? Did God say that? Is that in the Bible, what would Jesus do? That's what we're gonna look at tonight. We're gonna try to answer that question. Does God really say, hey, what would Jesus do? Is that in your heart? And when you hear that in a situation, when you go, what would Jesus do? Is that really what we should be asking? What would Jesus do? Well, I think the answer to that is no. God didn't say, what would Jesus do? We're going to look through scripture and we're going to dig through and you're going to go, well, maybe some of you that, have, that know your Bibles pretty well, you go, well, Jesus said this and he said that. 
But did he ever say, what would Jesus do? Of course not. Jesus didn't say that. Would God say that about his son? Maybe. You know, I think sometimes we get into circumstances, and if you ever have to ask that question, what would Jesus do? You're probably in a circumstance that is pretty tough. Or that is like overwhelming, like you don't have the answer for it. Like maybe you studied for your test. Maybe not quite enough. And that friend of yours had the class right before you, took that same test you're about to take. And they say, hey, do you want the answers to the test? And you stop and you go, what would Jesus do? You know the answer to that question, right? You already know the answer before you ever ask it. Maybe there was another situation of it's like, hey, I could go here, I could go there, I could do this for someone, I could do that for somebody, and the question gets raised, what would Jesus do? What I want to help you with is this. I think that sometimes our decision making gets clouded by the emotion in the situation, or maybe by the circumstances in front of us that's overwhelming and too big, and our mindset of what Jesus might do in that situation actually may not be the best assessment. That we're not even really good, as even as Christians, that we're not really good at deciding what would Jesus do in this circumstance. What we need to get better at is understanding what Jesus already did about the circumstance. You know that the earth, when it was created, when God created the earth, the earth was a place where fellowship with God happened, like all the time. And it was perfect, and the environment was perfect. In the garden, it was just a perfect environment where God and man walked together on a daily basis, but then something happened. Sin happened. People ask the question, why would God invent sin? Why would we ever have sin? Why was, there even an, why was there even a fruit to eat of that tree in the garden? And if you know the story, there was a tree in the garden where God said, hey, enjoy, but don't eat of that tree. Well, why would God even put that there, you ask the question, maybe. Well, I believe that God wanted to, if we're going to set up a relationship, there's got to be trust in a relationship. If you're ever going to have, if you're going to date someone, you're ever going to get married one day, for there to be a godly, awesome relationship, there's got to be a trust factor there. And you know what? I think God was, God was doing something and building trust and teaching what trust was. He said, hey, eat, hang out, do all that you do, but don't eat of that tree. And he was encouraging in the relationship there to be a trust component. Is God trustworthy? A couple of people believe it. If you believe God's trustworthy, say yes. Is he faithful? Is he ever true? Is he ever going to do what he said he was going to do? Yes, he is. But what happened? The enemy lied. The deceiver came and deceived. And what happened? They ate of the fruit after they were told not to. And then sin entered man. And suddenly there became, sin entered the earth. And there became problems in the earth where the, well, suddenly for, for a long time there, there was no fellowship between God and man. There had to be somebody, a prophet or someone who had to come tell somebody what, what God was saying. There was no longer communion and relationship with God that way. There was a separation until God sent Jesus into the earth. But Jesus restored the fellowship, right? We as Christians have a relationship with Jesus so that we can have fellowship and relationship with God again. What does that have to do with what Jesus would do? Well, you know what the good news is this, is that we can look back and see what Jesus did. Before Jesus, they had to live a life and go, I don't know, I can't can't hear from God. They didn't have the ability to hear from God unless God spoke to a man who then went and delivered it through a prophet. But we get to do life with Jesus. We get to actually not have to go, hey, what would Jesus do? We can know what Jesus would do because of what he already did do. Now, what did Jesus do? Well, there's a verse in the Bible that says Jesus went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. That's what he did. He did good and healed. So we get into a circumstance. What would Jesus do? Guess what Jesus would do? He would do good. What's good? Well, that definition in our culture today, what's good is like this. One day good could be this, and the next day good could be this, and the next day good could be this. But by, by biblical terms, there's definition for what good is. Good is, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then what? All these things will be added unto you. That's what good is. Good is to seek God. Good is to have a relation with God Almighty and, let, and trust his best. That's what good is. Instead of good being, well, in this circumstance, good and good and good. No, we know what good is. Good is what's God's best. That's what's good. And we can live that out. And, and we don't have to be clouded by emotion and circumstance and chaos and confusion that the earth has in it still. We get to walk through it and we get to navigate through going, hey, this is, what's, this is what Jesus' best is. This is what Jesus did. 
You know what, Jesus, I want to tell you a story. There's a story in John chapter 5. And there was, a, there was a bunch of like lame people, not lame like dumb, but like lame like broken, like couldn't walk lame. Maybe some blind people and some people who really had a lot of issues. And they used to hang around in this one area. And it was like, a, they call it the pool of, it, I can't even say the word, but it's like Bethsaida. There's like a pool of Bethesda. That's what it was, the pool of Bethesda. And they were around and one day Jesus came into that area and there's a guy there who had been lame for 38 years. He had just laid on a mat for 38 years. Can you imagine that existence where you're just laying on a mat? That's the best you could do. Just lay around all day. Some of you are like, man, that's pretty cool. I'd do that all day. Anybody want to just lay around for 38 years? Just lay on a couch or something, sofa, mat. Maybe an air mattress. I mean, come on, kick back. By the way, I slept. How about how many of y'all went on the uh, TNT camping trip? Come on. Yeah, campers. Come on, campers. I had me an air mattress. I lasted me about, let me see, it lasted about four hours, then it was flat. That was pretty awesome. 38 years on a mattress. Jesus walks up and he goes, what would you like me to do for you? The dude's lame. What would you like me to do for you? I'd like to be healed. And the, the deal was that when there, when there was a ripple in the water, the first person who could get to the water to touch the ripple in the water would be healed. That's how it worked. And Jesus said, well, let's do it. And he goes, well, I can't get up to get to the water. And Jesus said this. He said, get up, grab your mat, and go show yourself to the temple. Get up, grab your mat, like carry your air mattress out of here. You're good, dude. 38 years laying around. Well, what happened after that was when he went to the temple that he shows up and he's like walking. This guy that everybody knows has been laying around for 38 years. He shows up and they're like, how, how do you, what happened? Why are you here? And he says, this man healed me. His name was Jesus. Well, you're not allowed to heal on the Sabbath. It happened to be on the Sabbath when Jesus healed him. The, the people of the temple were like freaking out. No, you can't do that. No, that couldn't have happened. No, no, nobody, you know, could have done this. No, no leader, no, nobody special could have done this. It was on the Sabbath and he says, it, I don't know what happened to him. I, I don't, it was this guy because the Bible says that Jesus disappeared after he did it. Well, sure enough, Jesus shows up in the temple and he sees the guy. And he has a conversation with the people in the temple. And now I'm going to pick this story up. It's in John chapter 5, verse 15. And it says, it says this, it says, Then the man went and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had healed him. So the Jewish leaders began harassing Jesus for breaking the Sabbath, the Sabbath rules. But Jesus replied, My father is always working and so am I. So the Jewish leaders tried all the harder to, to find a way to kill him. Listen. From the time Jesus was a baby and word got out that the the king of the Jews was born, people have always come against God's best in Jesus. The name of Jesus today, in your school, in our culture, in the court system, in life, there's more resistance today than maybe ever before, but this didn't just start overnight. This is from the time that Jesus was a baby. You know that when Jesus was a baby, the, the leader of the known world at that time tried to kill all the babies two years old and younger for fear of threat that Jesus was going to be this king that was going to overthrow him. From his very birth, literally, so what happened? Jesus had to go. They, they, they went. They left the town. They went somewhere else. Went to a different area. And all through Jesus' life, this is happening. He's doing good and healing all the oppressive devil. And what happens? There's resistance. There's something that comes against him. So they're trying to find a way to kill him. Here it is again. For he not only broke the Sabbath, but he called God his father, thereby making himself equal with God. Next verse. So Jesus explained, I tell you the truth. The son can do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees the father doing. Whatever the father does, the son does also. Next verse. But for the father loves the son and shows him everything he's doing. In fact, the father will show him how to do even greater works than healing this man. Then you'll be truly astonished. Check this out. This is like Jesus talking trash. It's like, hey, you know what? You saw that? We'll do even better. What would Jesus do? You get into a circumstance? What would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? You know what? We know what Jesus did. Jesus did good and he healed. That's what he did. So if we're in a circumstance, we don't have to ask what Jesus would do. We go, we know what he did. You know what Jesus did? Jesus was connected to his father. And based on what his father did, that's what he did. Jesus had relationships. So the question is, is if Jesus did what he did, saw the father do, should we be doing what we saw Jesus do? Yes, we should. We shouldn't have to ask the question. We don't need to ask the question. You know what? I believe this. 
In this, in this passage of scripture, we can actually get some, some secret sauce. Anybody like secret sauce? Like, y'all, y'all gonna have turkey tomorrow. Some people like, they, they base their turkey different or they do different thing with a secret sauce. They, they, they do something special when they're, when they're making a pie. They don't always share all their, you know, all their stuff because they're secret about it. But you know what? I believe there's a secret to what, how, how to do life so that you don't have to, you know, crumble under pressure. You know what Jesus did when he was under pressure? what did he do? He did what he saw his father do. He was in connection with God Almighty and just did what was right every time. You want to do, you want to figure out what to do under pressure? Just do what's right. You know what says in Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and what? What's he say to do first? He says, seek God first, do the right thing first and all these things will be added unto you. You get in a circumstance, we shouldn't, we don't have to ask. We just do what's right. Is that hard to do though? Is it hard to do what's right every time? Come on, young people, it's hard to do what's right every time. It's hard for me to do what's right every time. I don't make the best decision every time. But you know, I make more good decisions today than I did before I knew Christ. And when I first came to Christ, when I first decided I'm gonna follow you, God, you know what, I had to learn how to do what's right. I didn't know what was right. So I would often ask questions like, well, I don't know, what what should I do here? And I think that's the question that's being asked, and what would Jesus do, what should I do here? But you know how you know? You grow. That's how you know, that rhymes, I'm a rapper. You know how you know is that you grow. You gotta continue to grow. You gotta continue to grow up in your relationship with God. You know Jesus, the Bible says this about Jesus. He said it grew in wisdom and stature before God and man. Jesus had to grow in who he was. He had to grow into, and he did grow into, the most incredible, we, had a, we just finished this series, that he is the greatest of all time. So for us to even wonder what could we do to be like the greatest of all time, man, that should be an easy, easy answer. Let's get in the word. Let's get in here and figure it out. Let's open our Bibles and figure out what Jesus did do so that we know what's possible. He says, I only do what my father tells me to do. But right before that in verse, let me see, up in verse, uh, verse 17, it says, but Jesus replied, my father is always working and so am I. And that might sound like, man, God's working? What does that look like? Is he like raking the, raking the yard or something working? No. I think he's actually saying this. We could, we could read it like this. That what God does works. His stuff always works. Jesus only does what works. What should we see? We should see results. When we make the God decision, we should see good, good results from it. And you go, how does that work? It's not always working out good because what about grandma over here or sister Sue and Sally and blah, blah, blah. You know what? Sometimes our short-term solution, we want to see it right here, right now. And God says, walk by faith, trust me. You said he's trustworthy, right? You believe that. He's trustworthy, we're going to see good fruit. And my Bible says this, it says Romans eight twenty eight. I think we have that up there. Romans eight twenty eight says, and we know all things. Somebody say all things. He causes all everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. Hey, if you do what's right, you know what? Good comes out of it. Just do what's right. He's always working on your behalf. He's working out good for you all the time. He's hooking you up all the time. Anybody like a good hookup? Come on. They call it a life hack sometimes. You want, you want, you want to know about the, that cheat code on your, on your game that you're playing? You want to hack this or hack that? You know what? The best hack we could ever do is just get on board with Jesus. The best thing we could figure out, the best, you know, cheat code out there is right here. We've got a manual on it. Let's get on board with his best. You know what? Here's how we connect with God. How are we going to get connected to what works? How are we going to know? There's a couple ways. We know what this says. You know what Jesus said? That he only did what he saw his father do. You know what? He could, could you think he could see heaven? Do you think he could see God in heaven? Do y'all believe that? He could see God? I, I, don't, I don't really believe that he like walked through life kind of looking up in the air, hoping God was up there to show him something. I think he knew God's character. What he understood about who his father was, he could do what his father did. You know what I can do? I can do what my father, my father's name is Ray. I know Ray, my father, my earthly father well. If somebody said to me, well, well, Ray's doing da 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 I would either believe it or not believe it based on my experience with him. I've done life with my father. I lived at home for 24 years or something, 23 years. I know what traits, what characteristics my dad has. I could even talk like my dad right now if I wanted to. I could grumble like my dad grumbles. I could 
do dumb stuff like my dad has done some dumb stuff over the years. But I know his character well so I can make decisions like he makes them. I can, I can see things the way he sees them because I've walked with him and done life with him. You know what? You can do what Jesus would do because you could do life with him. You understand what's possible because of having done life with him. You know what doesn't work though? Is going, well, I saw my grandma do that and she's a believer so I must just do it like that. You know what? Grandma might not be doing it all God's best all the time. There's plenty of Christians, sadly, there's plenty of believers that are just not going, hey, let's be hungry for this and continue to grow. If you're going to know what God's best is, you got to be growing. Now, that doesn't mean don't follow us because we're Christians, don't follow us. I'm saying, follow us, let's go. But if, if your grandma or your aunt, your uncle, your dad, your mom, your somebody is not growing in their relationship with God, guess what? Let's find somebody to follow that's growing. I talked to you about this last week. I said, man, these leaders around here, man, we take, we take extreme effort to go, hey, we put people in your life available to you that are doing incredible things in the natural, but you know, these people are hungry for God. And if they're not, we're having hard conversations with them about it. There are people you could follow that will help you grow. They will help you know God's character because they're living it out. They're walking around repenting when they fall short. When they blow it, they go, hey, will you forgive me? They're living the stuff out. But you know what? We won't know character if we don't spend time around God. Guess where God exists today in the earth? In a church environment, in a worship service, in a small group environment, doing life one-on-one with another believer. Hey, let's go and let's grow. And you can do it. We need real, genuine believers to follow, to do life with. I said this, all things work together for the good of those who love him. If we're finding people that are doing good, and I don't mean just doing good like they're making a bunch of money doing good, or they're, hey, they're, they have this big house, or they have this sweet car, or they have these cool shoes, or they get good grades, I'm not saying that. I'm saying deeper than the surface stuff. Going, hey, is this person walking in peace when it doesn't make any sense? You know, Keith, our worship leader, I was telling you about it last week, his, his, his son's been in the hospital. Keith's been sharing some stories about what's been happening around the hospital, and Harvey's doing a ton better. He's, he's doing great, actually. He's on his way to full health right now. Like, he's super good. But in the process of being in the hospital for a couple of weeks, Keith and Carly have been doing life side by side with doctors and nurses and people that are always seeing people in tough environments, tough situations. And Keith sent me a text uh, last night, actually. Maybe I could read it to you. I don't have my phone. But the story went like this, that a doctor was actually saying goodbye because the doctor was going to be off for a few days and he got to know Keith and Carly pretty well. And he was saying, listen, I deal with people who are freaking out all the time. Their kids are sick, they're not doing well, and parents are just blowing it. Like, they're just angry and freaking out. But you guys have such peace. You guys, in the midst of all this, you guys have stuck together and just continue to believe for what's possible. He's got not even a believer. This guy's not a believer. He's saying, hey, you, there's something different. And I just want to say, man, I am proud of you guys. That's a doctor in an ICU, like where babies and children are, are broken and hurting all the time. Another situation where Keith got to say to one of the doctors, listen, I know that you are, you've been designed for this. Do you understand the incredible anointing on your life? He's talking to a doctor in an ICU going, hey, there's an anointing on your life to do this. Man, you're doing a great job. Thanks for what you're doing. That's different. That's not what average Joe does. And what I mean by prospering and I mean by people that are going for it and doing well, I'm saying get behind some people that are going for it that aren't doing what everyone else is doing. But they're actually truthfully going, hey, my whole life is for you, Jesus. Let's go. And that's not even all that weird. It's not all that crazy. There's a bunch of people around this church that are going for it with God. Many of these leaders right here want what's best for you. Could you imagine 38 years? I'm telling you, this guy's laying on a mat for 38 years on a, just a mat broken life and then his life gets totally restored you think he might want to follow jesus after that yeah so what would jesus do he walks around he sees people that are hurting and broke you know what he'd do he would do good and heal you have the ability to do good and heal when the question is asked what should you do just do good and lay your hands on the sick and they will recover why is it not working i I do that i'm going for it you know what maybe you got to continue to grow What I'm saying is don't give up. If you're doing good right now, you're not seeing good fruit, man, keep going. Don't stop now. Keep going. This is a marathon. It's not a sprint. It's not, the race is not from here to there. The race is an entire lifetime. We're going for it. And you know what? The best is yet to come. God's got a future that's full of hope, Scripture says. He's got good stuff in store for you right out there. Keep going. Don't stop now. 
But there's issues, Pastor Brian, my family, you don't understand. My mom this, my dad that, alcoholics, da 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 You know what? Keep going, keep your head up and let's go. And there's people here that want to see you do it. You go, what, what should I do, Pastor Brian? You know what I'm going to say? What, would, what do you think we should do? Let's go. Let's look at the word. Let's see what Jesus did when it got hectic, when it got crazy. You know what he did? He followed his father. He knew his father's character. Let's know his character well. Let's make decisions based on his character and not on somebody else's experience over here. Let's experience life with Jesus. You can live life with Jesus. That's pretty awesome. You know, when we're left to ask the question, what would Jesus do? We have to somehow imagine what he would do. And you know what? Anybody ever like imagine something just crazy? I don't want to hear you're crazy right now, but anybody ever like thought of something just crazy? I- I've thought some crazy stuff before. I actually think some crazy stuff, some just bold, like way out there far stuff. And you know what? Sometimes I get my mind around, maybe Jesus would have done this or done that, or maybe he would, but you know what? I can always come back to what he did do. You don't have to live in wonder. You can know. Somebody say, I can know. know. One more time. I can know. know. You know, all of you guys have somebody that you would, you probably like do life with. And I've heard this happen before. I mean, I've been the youth pastor here for nine years. And before that I was leading for four or five years. So for the last 12, let's call it 14 years, I've heard people say, well, what would Brian do? I'm far from Jesus. Like, I don't make the best decisions all the time. You guys all have a, have a somebody that you would say, what would they do? In this circumstance, you're going through life and you might have this thought, I want to do what they would do. You know what? You don't have to just do what they would do or what I would do. Or you might even say, you know what? Miss Emily would do this. Or Caitlin would do this. Or Allison might do this. Or Keith would do this. Or Garrett would do it like this. Or Jason would do it like that. You know what? The truth is, none of that matters what I would do or how they would do it. Now, I could help you and I could guide you, but the truth is, let's do what Jesus did do. Not what he might do or we can imagine he do. Let's do what he did do. And what he did do was the most successful life ever lived. That's what he did do. He lived a life that was the greatest ever. We can't watch grandma and grandpa and expect to just figure it out how to be a Christian. We're going to have to get in here and study it out. You know what the Bible says about the word of God, what it talks about in here? What it says in the word here is that the word of God will divide even your bone from your marrow. It will divide even your thoughts and intents of your heart. If we get in here and we study this out, we can find out stuff that's on the innermost part of our being that nobody else knows about us. And it'll show us what to do about those things. When you lay in bed at night and you're freaking out about whatever you're freaking out about, you know what? This thing has answers for you. You don't have to wonder what's the answer to this or to that. I want to show you a verse in 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1 is talking about the word, verse 1 through 4. This is all about the word. All about this word, the Bible, the word of God. It says, it says, what was from the beginning What we have heard, what we have seen with our own eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested, which means Jesus was manifested. He was the word. That's what the Bible calls him was the word. It says, and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested, was shown to you. Next verse, verse three. Verse three says, what we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed our fellowship is with the father and with his son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. Our joy may be complete if we will walk with Jesus. Not wonder, but actually do life with Jesus. The best way to do life with Jesus is to get this on the inside of you. It's great to have the Spirit of God living on the inside of you. But you know what? The Word is concrete. This is not changing. It's forever settled. The Word is the Word. And the Spirit of God on the inside of you is going to light this thing up. It's not just another book to read. It's not just another story to read. When we talk about a guy who was lame for 38 years, he really was lame for 38 years, and God raised him up off a mat. It's a true story. And I don't know what's got, what your issue might be. This guy was, was paralyzed. He was lame for 38 years. It was an issue in his life. We all have issues. You know, God wants to get into the innermost part of our issues and get them right. 
You can read stories, this will come alive. But not if you never pick it up. It is, it is the most power-packed, most potential, strongest, most ridiculous thing in the earth is this guy right here. Because this releases power through you. Sitting on a shelf, it's another book with a ton of power. More than any dynamite or more than anything. anything. But when he gets on the inside of you, now you've got power because it's getting on the inside of you. And we don't have to wonder what Jesus might do. We can do all that he says we can do. You know, there's a verse in the, in the Bible. It's in James, and it says this. Let's not just be hearers of the word, but let's go be doers of the word. You know what it's good? It's good to hear stories about what's in here. I could tell you story after story after story. We could have story time every week. We could sit here and I could give you story time. But you know what? That won't change you. Stories won't change you. You know what will change you? Putting your faith in that story. Putting your faith in the life of Jesus Christ. So that you can encounter stuff right in the middle of chaos. And I'm telling you, Keith and Carly have been right in the middle of chaos with their son. Just on the cusp of like life and death for a couple weeks. And you know what they've been able to do? They've been, walk, been able to walk in peace. You know, two weeks ago, Pastor David Gammon preached a message right here about Jesus being the best napper. How many of y'all were here for that? That in the midst of a storm, what did Jesus do? Jesus was taking a nap in a boat. There was another story of three, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they went into a, into a fire. They were like thrown in a fiery pit because they wouldn't bow down and worship some other God. They said, no, my God will, my God will deliver me. They had peace. You know how they have that? Because they got something on the inside of them that's greater than what's on the outside. But that doesn't get on the inside of you just by going, oh, that's a great story, Pastor Brian, I'll do that. No, we have to devour this thing. We gotta be hungry for this thing. The Bible says if you'll hunger and thirst for righteousness, you'll be filled. That's my heart, is that you would be filled with the word of God. We gotta get hungry for the right things. And then we'll be able to do what Jesus did instead of just wonder what he might have done. I'm gonna ask you to stand to your feet. We're gonna pray. If I get the band to come to the stage... Y'all want to worship a little bit? Yeah. Come on. One of the best ways that you can show how thankful you are to God in your life is worship. All worship is is saying thanks, really. Just being in awe. Just going, man, God, you're good. We talk about, you know, miracles that he wants to do, that he has done in your life. And we worship and we say, thanks, God. Man, you're good. And I think the more thankful that we're, we, we take a day out of the year to have Thanksgiving, right? The more thankful we can be and live a life of Thanksgiving like that, wow. Jesus will come alive on the inside of you. Let's pray. Jesus, thanks. Thanks for your word. God, I think that it is forever settled. It's not changing. God, we can know your character. We can know who you are. And God, we can do what Jesus did. We don't have to wonder. We don't even have to think, man, what, what might he do? God, I think that you have shown us You've written it down for us. God, we could study it out. We can read it. We can spend time in it. And God, I think that your spirit that lives on the inside of us as believers will awaken, will make the word of God come alive. God, I think that your word is true and that you say that when it goes out, it'll accomplish what it was sent to do. God, I think if your word accomplishing what it was sent to do to stir up a hunger tonight, to know your character well. God, we want to be hungry to know you well. Help us to do that, God. As we worship you tonight, we want to give you all the place in our hearts and our lives to be first. God, be first in this place. You're worth it. You're the highest of the highs, the king of the kings. And we say, be honored, be magnified, be made big here in Jesus' name. Somebody say amen. 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 Let's worship Jesus.